You guys want to know what my favorite coordinate system is? Like for realsies, it's totally polar coordinates because polar coordinates are so cool. Look, let me show you what we can do. You can take, um, I just switched colors before writing anything, that's right. You can take yourself the Cartesian coordinate system with the X coming out at you and the Z going up on the paper. And then what you're going to do, it's very similar to polar coordinates in that you're talking about an angle and where something is. So here I'm going to kind of draw a polar coordinate system circle. Now in polar coordinates, we'd be talking about this circle flat. Now we're looking at it like the circle is actually coming out of the page at us. So that's why it appears to be an oval. But I'm going to draw another one raised up a distance z. Let's see how we do with that. It's got to be centered around the z axis. This is another oval that's supposed to be identical to that one. That one looks like it's at a different angle. It's not supposed to be at a different angle. Dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. But the separation between these two guys is z. You can tell that they are each... Uh, one of them is in the XY plane and the other one is parallel to the XY plane, but raised up a distance Z. Let's see if I can label that. No, let's just do it later. Let's say uh, we're looking at describing a point that's at this location right here. And we're going to name that point P because what else would you possibly call a point? And then I think it's interesting, well, you're going to need to know how to specify how high up it is. And that's super simple. We're going to call that dis... Oh, that's way close to the other purple. Unacceptable. We're going to call that distance Z. That's the distance up above the XY plane, and that's why this is such a simple coordinate system. You've got Z as the distance above the XY plane, and then we just have to use polar coordinates right here. So you're taking, essentially you're taking all of space and you're making polar coordinates with stacked planes of polarity. Um, so in polar coordinates, we have two things to worry about. We have to know how far out the thing is. This should be a dotted line. See how dotty it is right now? And then there's a distance, aura, of course. And there's also an angle, theta, which is the angle away from the x-axis counterclockwise, just as you know from polar coordinates. But cylindrical coordinates just allow this plane to be shifted up and down relative to the proper x-y plane. <laughs> and we're going to um, we're gonna want to find components of this because trying to figure out what's going on in the relationship. I'm kind of lacking colors. Let's let's do like a, an electric line. We're gonna try to find, let's see, the X and Y com components of this guy right here because Z is super obvious, it's just Z. But X is gonna be right there and Y is gonna be right there. So if we're making a table so that we can do our um, determinant of the Jacobian, then the table is gonna look like this. X equals, let's see, we're talking about that side of this triangle right here. So it's gonna be R times the cosine of theta, R uh, cosine theta, y equals r times sine of theta, and z is z! Yay! That's why it's so fun, because z is so special. But don't worry, z doesn't have to be special. You could put z any direction you want and just set up your polar coordinate system to take advantage of some symmetries in the problem. Ah, brown's a color I haven't used. Now we already know that the differential volume element, dv, is going to be the determinant of the Jacobian, determinant of Jacobian, times dr d theta dz. Cute. And the determinant of the Jacobian, based on these relationships right here, is um, pretty fun to calculate. Let's do that now. Yay! Here's how we do it. We put this over here so that we can remind ourselves of those things. And we are trying to find the determinant of the Jacobian, which is the partial of x and y and z, as we're making this conversion, with respect to, of course, our and theta and uh, z. Oh, that's gonna be a fun one, isn't it? And then we're supposed to find the determinant of that matrix. So, uh, let's get ourselves a little matrix that we're looking to find its determinant. Uh, I'm taking the derivative of x with respect to r and theta and z. And this guy right here with respect to r 
is just cosine theta, and with respect to theta is negative r sine theta. With respect to z, well, it doesn't change if z changes. And then the next line is y as a derivative, we need a derivative with respect to r, that's just going to be sine of theta. We need a derivative with respect to theta, that's just going to be our uh, cosine theta, and then with respect to z, uh, it doesn't change again. Now z is kind of cool because it doesn't change with respect to x and y. Yay! Whoop! Whoop! And it does change with respect to z. Like, like onely, it does. So the determinant becomes fantastically simple. Let's go to uh, this guy times the determinant of that matrix, which is simply r cosine theta times cosine theta, right? And then minus negative r sine theta times sine of theta. Oh, are you kidding me? The minus signs cancel out. We can factor out an r, and inside of here we've got cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. That means that, what does it mean? It means the differential volume element is just r times dr d theta. It's easy, sorry. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so all this is saying is that there is more volume if, let's go back to our original sketch. There is more volume if you're farther out, but it's just linear in farther outness. You don't get any more volume for any particular theta because it's perfectly symmetric in theta. And you don't get any more volume for um, going any particular distance in z because the other dimensions don't change as z changes. So that's that's kind of why the determinant of the Jacobian is a meaningful thing if you're changing units. But this guy right here, that guy, is going to be critical because a lot of people think, well, okay, so. So this, this quantity right here, is actually dx, dy, dz. In Cartesian, it's just so simple. It's only slightly more awesome if you go to cylindrical coordinates. Remember, this is the same kind of thing that you get if you go to polar coordinates, where there is more circle length as we're further out in the circle. So we didn't really expect anything different, and we didn't really get anything different. So now we're ready to calculate things like uh, cylindrically symmetric quantum functions, which would be weird, or moments of inertia. Burp.